So, I will start. So, welcome to my presentation. Thanks for coming. It's quite late evening, but um, anyway, uh, the main goal of my presentation, I just would like to share my experience and experience of my team, which I work in with um, regarding the splitting the monolith application to microservices. And we can discuss um, uh, benefits of that, uh, challenges, in which cases monolith wins, in which case in which cases microservice makes hands. Uh, so regarding their format, so please ask questions every time and I try to look in the chat and uh, answer um, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and of course, in the end, we have also time for the dedicated time for the question. But if you have a question, don't wait until end of presentation to ask it immediately. Uh, so presentation will contain some some parts. Um, first one, I would like to make a short introduction to the use case. It's an e-commerce application, so just classical e-commerce shop when we sell the goods. Uh, make overview as initial monolith architecture that we have and uh, explain a bit what was good with monolith. Yeah, so monolith is not, not always bad. Uh, but from other side, we of course have some pain points with the monolith application. I'll explain which one and what exactly our motivation to split it. After that, uh, we uh, go the uh, a way I explain a way how to uh, we, uh, refactor the system. Uh, very important from my point, from my my side, from my point of view, uh, is that it's not happens in one step, not a big bank um, stuff. Uh, so we make it iteratively step by step. And it's quite interesting how to keep the system working, how to implement the new features, but in parallel, improve the architecture in sense of microservice. Yeah. Um, and of course, with the microservice, we have some challenges, some new challenges. Yeah, That's not a free lunch. And I go through all of them and um, provide the options how to resolve it. Um, and from uh, uh, make a short conclusion and recommendation at the end. So let's go ahead. Shortly about me, uh, I'm working as a platform architect by Conrad Electronic. Or exactly, this is e-commerce project that so uh, sell some goods in Germany and in Europe. I also um, participate in an Apache community and a PMC in Apache 6 f projects. Like basically provide a, a framework for REST and uh, SOAP uh, interfaces and uh, services. And I also make some contributions in the Apache Syncorp, Apache Ares, uh, CARAF projects. And sometimes up until I speak to into the technological and methodological conference. Okay, about projects, what we, we are doing. Um, basically, it's a, a e-commerce system, it's a classical e-commerce system with uh, users, cards, checkouts, products, orders, and fulfillments. Um, I mostly speaking about backend, frontend. That's also quite interesting. There's also some uh, evaluations, but it's more or less out of scope of my presentation today. This uh, frontend was migrated for the. Uh, uh, single page applications and with JavaScript. Uh, so backend, uh, we have uh, three teams split it more or less from the business domains as a card checkout, user order, and products. So all, all, all to do with products and availabilities, it has its own team, and every team has about seven to eight persons. So, so normal Scrum team is a bit, 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 is a bit higher. Initial technologies this was a Java application as deployment. We take the choose uh, uh, Apache Caraf, uh, the OGI based deployment. So um, database accesses was uh, um, based on the Hibernate, uh, SQL. Messaging was organized with ActiveMQ and REST interface Apache 6. And we use the Scrum methodology to do it. So if you look a bit into the um, global uh, architecture, uh, so in the middle is a blue box is middleware, so exactly what, what I would like to uh, talk today. They provide REST API for consumers. Uh, there's uh, different consumers. There's a uh, front end, of course, the JavaScript front end. 
Also some external consumers like uh, terminals, uh, some external sellers who uh, would like to use our API in on, uh, for, for uh, provide own, uh, uh, to organize own checkout process, for example. Uh, also mobile applications are uh, our, our consumers. So we basically we are provide we exposing public API for, for, for those consumers. Uh, internally, also have access to some external systems like um, financials or the external payment providers, different kind of PayPal, credit cards, and Genicor. They check the client customer's credit worthiness. Uh, communicating with SAP, so fulfillment is done completely for the SAP, as uh, typical for Germany. Uh, persistence layer is positive SQL, later also use MongoDB. And messaging, active in queue. This is more or less uh, the Architecture is a classical. Uh, but if you're looking inside the middleware, it uh, was organized between the interesting way. Uh, so the whole components, what you see here in the all blue boxes was deployed in the single uh, OSGI container. So it's, all components are single Java virtual machine. So it's not split it uh, somehow in this instance of JVMs. But uh, we provide already separate services in the first step. So it was uh, user card, checkout, article, order, uh, event service, and, and so on. So it's about 17 services. So, so all services were deployed in the same container. Uh, the next layer that you see is uh, domains. Idea of domains was that if, service, if some services has a shared functionality, we uh, extract and put it into the domains. So this kind of reusing code shared between different sites. So for example, both user and card working with a customer uh, and this code related to the customer is in customer domains and so both services can use it. And um, unfortunately, it was a typical also for a lot of projects, we have a big, a huge core domain model where the all core stuff that's used by every component, by services, also by other domains, I put it here. This was quite a huge uh, stuff. Uh, connection to the database was organized through the repositories, so that access object and entities. Uh, and all services shared the same entity in the same database. So it was three databases, but the services shared. So it's not uh, clear split. Uh, SAP and JMS was done for the separate connectors. That's basically, that's our initial state, what we started from. Uh, what was good with this architecture and why? Uh, so I, I think, I still think that perhaps also, so starting with Monolith was not a bad solution. And the first, what I uh, would like to, uh, I observe that with Monolith, uh, it's quite quick start and um, very fast first achievement. You can show results very quickly. For the customer, sometimes it's in our project was 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 very important, and uh, so I think the the, the the start point for Monolith is not bad, so not not always bad. Uh, second, uh, it's quite simple to build and deploy. Uh, so we have single containers, we have single repository. Okay, but we have some multiple repositories, but it's still quite easy to uh, build the stuff and deploy with, with a Monolith application. Uh, monitoring was also because it's also a single container. We put uh, uh, some Jamix uh, metrics. You can observe uh, memories, uh, the memory CPU. You can observe the thread state. It's still single container and quite quite easy, quite simple. Uh, also, every team receive clear deployment, release, and development guidelines. It's not all not always optimal. Yeah, they, was sometimes strange and complicated, but at least they are well defined. So the teams knows how to deal with them. Uh, remote communication between the components was uh, quite less because they uh, all uh, live in the same Java virtual machine and we use uh, OSGI services. So OSGI services basically is a kind of REST services, but inside JVM. So they share the interfaces, and for the interfaces, you can provide one or more implementations. And you bind the uh, 
clients or consumers of the service for using their interface. So it's quite a good decoupling because consumer knows only your interface and in using all the OGI mechanisms there uh, behind the interface, you provide some one or more implementations. Uh, also, administration was homogeneous by DevOps, was not easy, but at least was a uh, uh, single technology. So the DevOps need to administrator need to know. This is uh, basically the benefits what, what, what we have as Monolith. It just helps us to achieve result in some months or not a weeks, but in some months we can have first running services and uh, mine the clients, provide the IPI, and uh, it was a really, really quick start with it. From other side, with the time, especially with the time, uh, when the team grows and the code base grows, uh, we see also some pain points, let's say, in the monolith. What exactly was the pains? Uh, first observation me was that the migration of the uh, new software so upgrade was quite difficult and it takes a lot of time. So we plan migration for, for, for new Java for months and uh, it takes uh, uh, a weeks uh, to prepare it and a uh, huge um, synchronization alignments process because you either migrate all the whole monolith, so all services, all components for all teams, or nothing. Yeah, so there's no, it's very difficult to somehow to do it in an iterative way. And the same with upgrade of the Hibernate versions, Apache 6, Ceph, it was a, a very big action, very painful actions, and takes a lot of time. Sometimes people even say, keep it the old version, it's running, and it's, it's, it's good. Yeah. This is a, the first observation what I have. Um, the evaluation of new technologies uh, and introduction of new technologies was also becomes difficult because it's always a danger to break something with other team if you bring the new shared components. Uh, the services cannot be scaled independently. So you either scale the whole stuff, so the whole, the whole container with all services or nothing. So again, it's, uh, uh, we put, for example, with a, with a, with a corner electronic, we have uh, um, in the Christmas, before Christmas time, about factor three of the traffic in the, in the shop. Uh, but you, uh, we organize some additional instances of, of, of the container, but we cannot do it individually for, for the services, so it's not possible in the one. Um, also, it's painful uh, or even dangerous was that the whole services share the com common HTTP pool and database connection pools. So if something happens with one service, for some reasons, uh, there are a lot of uh, threads uh, uh, waiting for uh, processing in the pool and pool is exhausted very quickly. So very often we see because of problem with single service with one service, all other services are not reachable. Yeah, so the whole container dies. And the same with the, with the database connection pool. So as soon as uh, all services share the same pool, if there is one table, uh, a special process has slowed down or uh, for some reasons, so forget to indexes or something like this. Also the database pool is exhausted very quickly and uh, all services are suffering because of that. Um, also it's quite easy to break the whole container for other teams. So if one team has a wrong deployment, make something wrong, uh, the whole container is not starting, not go up and the, all, the, the, all teams need to wait for the uh, test systems, for staging system. And it also happens sometimes in the production that uh, because of some, some, some mistakes, uh, we just uh, have no kill uh, the whole instance of the, uh, with, with all services. Also, I observe that uh, because of complexity of deployment and complexity of the monolith, uh, the container, the development cycle is quite long. So especially if you don't deploy it for some time, some days, and development go through there, uh, you normally need to invest uh, a quarter an hour or 20 minutes or even half an hour to, um, give, uh, to, to, to get the working environment. 
and to start uh, uh, deploying your feature and to test it. So between uh, features ready on your development environment and is deployable uh, locally and testable takes about so half an hour, 15 minutes. But of course, slow down the deployment. And of course, the common model support, the shared stuff in the code was very painful. Yeah, so it's easy to break it. There's a parallel modification for different teams. Different teams have different ideas and the synchronizers is quite, quite difficult. And I also observed that there were a few persons common in the project. So learn the monolith stuff, deployment, uh, interdependencies between the models is quite long and quite difficult. So this is uh, basically our motivation that we should change something in the architecture. Again, that's not mean that architecture is wrong, but after some time, the project evaluate uh, and uh, uh, the architecture should be adapted to the new uh, situation. So I just classified as in the table what kind of uh, problem we have with monolith. Uh, keep it up to date uh, the software resilience because of shared, a lot of shared stuff, uh, especially pools. Uh, shared deployment, when you can deploy and break something with, uh, for, for other teams. Development cycle becomes long. This is the most critical problems. Less critical was uh, the innovation it takes more time to uh, come in the, in, the, in the project. Scalability that you're going to scale service independently, you can scale all the, the whole stuff. And uh, code quality, code based best, best, uh, best practices is sometimes hard to uh, follow because uh, a lot of people modify in the same model. This is uh, the pain points. Yeah, this is basically was our uh, uh, situation. And to this point, we uh, think about that we should change something and uh, perhaps uh, we need some smaller parts, uh, controllable parts, and we meet, they, they need more independency in the teams. Therefore, um, the first steps of step zero, uh, uh, also very important to mention that, of course, I cannot, as a architect and uh, uh, the team cannot say to management, we stop development, we stop uh, uh, evaluation of the system and make a um, migration for half a year. So this was not possible. Therefore, we need to do it step by step in an iterative way. And step zero that I also recommend for um, for all teams, the first step was a decoupling uh, services from the consumers, from the consumers. You can put a um, gateway in between or uh, it's possible to do it for the facade. But important that consumer speak with some intermediate uh, instance, and this instance decide where the request is routed. Either it's routed to the old system or routed to the new system. You even can do kind of canary releases when you put only part of the traffic, for example, 10% of the traffic on the new microservices, and see how it behaves. And only after that, switch the consumer completely on the new microservice. Also, to have some instances in parallel, of course, it costs a bit uh, computing resources. But for us, the site is very nice because you can functionally test it. You can compare the result of the integration tests as our, our green. You can make a load test, also compare the result of load tests, either you not degrade the performance. So it's uh, really nice to have some time for, for the some time the old service and then new service in parallel and dynamically switch it using the gateway. So this is basically step zero for the migration. Uh, for us, it's also, we have uh, for some services, two parts. One uh, core services uh, responsible to uh, deliver the content project and sell content projects. But there's another, another kind of services marketplace which is responsible to sell uh, products from uh, other sellers. Uh, and uh, the facade uh, on the top, they decouple this uh, difference from the end uh, consumer. So the consumer in the, in the, in the, in the cart uh, adds the marketplace products and uh, conduct products and says transparent is basically doesn't matter for the, for the consumer. So facade is a kind of hides this um, separation for end customer. And uh, it's also facade, uh, on the base of facade, you can split the, uh, uh, so, wrote the request either to old monolith microservice uh, or new 
microservices. So it's either to do it on the uh, gateway, using gateway or using facade, doesn't matter. Important that the consumer don't speak directly with the, with the endpoint of the service. Um, the next step, step one, we're thinking about what is the best candidates, which services could be split and separated first. But after some um, uh, thinking, um, I decide to do it with the simple service. So service to be split, the, easy, the easiest services to split, they have less dependencies from the monolith, they're small and they are um, quite independent already. And so the splitting of it is quite uh, uh, easy step and could be, the, could be done quickly. Why uh, uh, go this way? Because team, the first team have a first achievement very quickly. It's a good motivation to continue with that. And uh, the second, uh, you have a bit feeling how to work with microservices, how to monitor it, how to collect the logs. And it's good as it's not uh, happens uh, with a very critical and very, uh, so complex microservices. You can start small and do it on the um, not very critical um, services and uh, easy to understand. So for us, it was event services I collect some events. Uh, uh, so for uh, middleware and uh, front end and provide it's for analytics system. And also address services got decoupled to use some um, external address suggestion, but uh, basically it's quite independent stuff. Yeah. And we, we uh, started with the uh, splitting of uh, this kind of services. Uh, it's about six or seven services that's uh, independent and would decoupable, extractable from the model. This is, was the first step. Uh, so achieve it quite quickly and team start to deal with the microservice world already. So the, the, all the rest services still live in monolith and will be used for monolith. It will be Container will be a bit uh, smaller, yeah. So there are some service already extracted, but it's still a lot of stuff and core functionality was in inside one. The next step was extracting services with uh, uh, different scalability requirements. For example, we have a price and availability service that takes um, more than thousand requests per second, and we have a checkout service that has uh, some uh, ten requests per second, for example. Uh, so it's should, of course, should this scale it differently. And uh, therefore, uh, with the service with high scalability requirements was also extracted from the monolith and uh, put it in the, the Docker and Kubernetes. So here, so really, we can uh, downgrade the monolith because uh, the most critical services that have a high load are extracted and the traffic you know, the monolith is reduced. It's, Factor 10, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, so this step was quite important to achieve a, a more robustness, resilience of uh, price availability and product service that have a high load, and also to uh, relax a bit the monolith uh, applications. Um, the next step was. Um, a bit not extracting the microservice itself. Uh, I just we decided to make a bit uh, code independent code refactoring. So the service is still deployed in the same uh, only container in OSI container. But uh, what we would like to achieve is that they, every team has own code bases. So they not share stuff, but have uh, separate independent code bases. And a uh, way to do it was quite simple, just copy, really copy one-to-one -one domains uh, code into the vertical teams. So every team received just own copy with a, of, of domain with other package name of Java package, but uh, with uh, the same functionality. So it's a um, very um, strong violation of uh, dry principle. So don't repeat yourself because we duplicate uh, a lot of code with this step, but achievement uh, was that uh, every team start to work with the independent code bases. So, and uh, the fact that we have uh, duplicate uh, some functionality 
uh, for me, it was less important as independent from the team code. And every team start to refactor the domains throughout the staff, or not don't need um, gradually improve the quality, try the new technologies a bit, and try to new code, code practices. And basically, the team can make with the uh, domains uh, what they want. Core domain was extracted uh, a bit another way. Uh, also, it takes all business functionality and put it in the relevant verticals. Uh, and uh, the rest stuff, the technological only technological and technical stuff is uh, was 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 uh, preserved as a um, shared library. But they have kind of uh, this library have a kind of uh, third party own life cycle, own release cycle, and we just. Uh, interpret as a third party dependency for us. So in spite of that, uh, the, every team has their own code bases and could work independently, but still deploy in the same container. Uh, so they still the all problems related to the container is there, but the, uh, the code basis was split. The next step um, is uh, still uh, uh, in progress, it's not finished for now, uh, to split the, the, the more complicated core uh, business services. So there's a user service card, checkout, and order service. So the, uh, the, um, every service will deploy it in the separate container um, in the Docker and uh, uh, so run in, in the Kubernetes. But very important, I decide also for this step to uh, keep the shared database. So it's also a violation of the uh, microservice principle that uh, basically every service could have their own storage, but for us it was very important to have new technological bases as soon as possible and uh, mitigate the uh, problems related to the common deployment. And only uh, shared data was also a bit pain, but not so hard as a technological. Therefore, I decided for to split it um, first on the core devices and only after it on the, on the data bases. So I can debate. So for some some people have other other opinion. But for me, uh, really, this situation was uh, a more pragmatic and a quick solution to, do, to, to go this way. Uh, so after this step, we have um, separate, uh, uh, separate core services, still indexing the same database. And the last step is also uh, not finished, but it's um, very important to do that they split the databases also so that uh, every service becomes on own own database so before uh, for example we have even share on the table uh, using the foreign keys for example a card service uh, has dependency on the user uh, uh, so the card table has dependency on the user table and to use joint database join to receive this information from the table after that uh, every service becomes own uh, data and it's not possible that one service directly uh, accesses the data from the uh, database with other service. But they still, the card service still need the information from user or check out needs information from the order. How we do it, how we organize it, we uh, use the two different approaches here. Um, the first is uh, just user service, for example, provide necessary information through the API from the REST API. So instead of going directly into the database, card service asked uh, necessary information for the API and user service provide. So it works quite good if um, the information not changed very often and um, it can leave with uh, some performance penalty because of, of course, the uh, remote access for the REST API uh, is uh, a bit more slow as a direct access in, in, into the database. Uh, another way what uh, also uh, we uh, apply uh, is uh, asynchronous synchronization between data storage. For example, for the between card and checkout service, if something changes in the card, card service just publish the event um, uh, into the topic. And uh, checkout service is responsible to synchronize the own copy of the card data. So they're still decoupled. They have every every service has their own copy of the data, but they synchronized using asynchronous mechanism. Um, so it's uh, very useful if the data changed very often and should be synchronized as soon as possible. So, uh, they, they still have some eventual consistencies. There is a moment until the data is synchronized, but 
from business perspective, it's okay to have it not immediately in sync. And yeah, so it works quite well. So this is basically um, the first, uh, the, the, the last step uh, of the extraction of microservices and target view was that we uh, have deployed, deployed the services into uh, Kubernetes cluster in the ports and every service has uh, own uh, database uh, tables. So they don't have shared tables in the uh, persistent storage. This is our target view. Uh, of course, this is a new word. Um, in the microservices, what I said is not a free launch. Uh, we have some um, challenges. We have some technical challenges and also some organizational challenges. Uh, Started from the technical uh, challenge, uh, it's absolutely necessary to have continuous delivery in microservice world because in Monolith, you still have could have some manual actions. But in microservices, when it's really so 50 or 100 microservices, it's not possible to do it manually. So it's absolutely necessary to have a CD. Uh, you need a monitoring solution, uh, of course, because um, there are a lot of uh, instances of microservices and very important to have overview and have uh, alarms and um, somehow, so some kind of the, uh, signals if uh, something goes wrong with uh, services. and Diagnostics, you, can, you, you need to find out what, what exactly is the problem in the system. Uh, central logs is uh, also uh, absolutely necessary because uh, in Monolith, you still could, in theory, go to the instance and looking for the errors in the log of instance. The microservices world is not, not, not really possible. Yeah, so you have, uh, uh, have a, um, some hundred of instances and uh, logs should be centralized and uh, provide elastic set possibility on that. Uh, message tracing and debugging becomes also very important because before we have a lot of local interfaces, so local uh, uh, communication from, from, from the local interfaces inside the same Java machine. And then when microservices start remote communication and uh, it's absolutely necessary to see which uh, steps, which services uh, message goes through, how much time it's spent in every step and uh, which service causes the problem if there are some, some, some error. Uh, this is kind of uh, technical challenges, uh, so some organizational challenges. What to do if a uh, feature required changes in the multiple service? So before, we have uh, shared code bases and you can easily uh, develop and deploy the, the stuff. Now the, you have um, independent deployment cycles for the teams, independent plans, but sometimes for some features, it need to, uh, to implement some features, it need to change, uh, to apply the changes in the different microservices, how to deal with it. Um, also, we face sometimes that the microservice was split it in the wrong way, so too fine-grained sometimes, or, or, or uh, just incorrect. And also, team responsibilities was not optimal. Uh, need to update and change it. Also, the release cycles and central quality assurance uh, need to be changed because before we have a fixed releases, uh, I guess once per three weeks or once per month, so we release the all components, deploy it on the uh, staging system, and say, QA, yeah, now you can test the release. And after some testing phase, they uh, deploy it on the production. This microservice water doesn't work because every team responsible for uh, a test and uh, deploying the microservices and they could do it every day or even every hour. So the, the old style just doesn't work. And also sometimes it was uh, difficult to say in the product, which is a production state, which what features are implemented, and either feature is completely deployed in the production or not. So this is uh, also against a challenge which we faced. Uh, regarding um, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment from service uh, itself was quite easy. So we provide a, a G plugin that builds a Docker image, and after the compile and running the unit tests, a G plugin builds a 
Block image is published in the uh, Google Docker uh, registry for deployment for, for later deployment. Uh, deployment pipeline is, was a bit complicated because uh, we need some Google Cloud functionality. And you have a two separate repository, service repository itself to build a Docker image. The Docker image is pub was published in the, in the, in the registry. Uh, but additional repository was a Helm chart for Kubernetes. And uh, Helm chart basically is a setup uh, for, for, for microservices in, in Kubernetes cluster. And for uh, by every changes, by every push and or match in the uh, Helm chart repository, we start uh, uh, it's a triggers a deployment. Um, the first uh, repository should copy it in the Google Cloud repositories and using the Terraform uh, deployment image, deployment script is deployed in the, deployed in the uh, uh, production, uh, in the uh, Kubernetes cluster environment. And Terraform is also responsible to apply environment specific variables. Uh, so if uh, some uh, settings or variables are dependent on the, on the, uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, they are uh, uh, so Terraform is responsible to to to, to apply. It. Important that really for the every push or match, the, the whole pipeline started, and at the end we have deployed stuff on the Kubernetes cluster, and we can start integration tests. Uh, so the, very important to see this integration test either you commit your deployment was successful or not. Our monitoring solution we are using the commercial product Instana uh, with, uh, for, for that to be able to monitor everything uh, and our technical parameters of the um, uh, Kubernetes cluster ports and also can trace um, the messages, see which services has a problem of persistence layer as well. You can uh, enter the ID from the log and see the whole round trip of the message, the whole span. Uh, for login solution, we just use uh, uh, flying bit parsers. Uh, so the every service just run the logs in the estate out. And flying bit parser extracts some important variables. For example, how long operation uh, takes, how, uh, what is the uh, service operation. That's, a, that's a easy to, uh, after that, it's easy to use these this variables in the uh, uh, gray log search in the Uh, so uh, the search uh, in the uh, central gray log cell. That's a uh, elastic search. So, so the, the whole system was basically placed in the single, so accessible from the single place, from the single command. So you put some uh, span ID, you can uh, easily see what uh, happens with the message. See also some uh, variables here already extracted by flying beat, for example, what the service operation was, a get cut, what is the uh, um, span ID, what is the service class as implemented, and, and, and so on, what kind, how long it takes. So this was three milliseconds in this case. Um, for tracing, we use a proprietary solution. So every service has a JAXRS filter, so it's generate a span ID. And every log uh, includes a span ID in the log statement, and the client propagates span ID for other services. Uh, yeah, so this looks like this in the log. You see the corner session ID as a session, a session from the browser. You can trace it. And uh, marketplace request ID is a kind of span ID. It's, um, it's uh, uh, stays the same for the whole message round tree for the all services. So uh, facade services and persistent layer. So you, you will see it. Uh, instead, preparatory solution, you can also uh, think about using the Spring Boot Slois uh, or Zipkin Brave. Basically, makes the same uh, as a proprietary stuff, um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, out of the box. So, if you use contextually use the Spring Boot uh, uh, MVC model and um, REST templates, then you can apply uh, also use uh, benefit from out of the box solution. Um, how we resolve some uh, other organizational challenges? Uh, features with span multiple service very important to work in compatible ways. So, uh, it, as far as you don't break the other teams, you can implement the software and deploy it and uh, even deploy the production. 
Yeah. So communication between team, of course, is uh, also important. And also the lesson learned for me is that uh, if, if there is too much dependencies, so perhaps you should rethink a bit the boundaries of microservices and split it in another way. So if a lot is a, every feature requires the changes in a, in, in a um, different microservice. Uh, splitting microservice and team responsibilities, uh, yeah, we need to rethink it sometimes, especially in the case of growing calls and depends on if uh, there cycle calls between microservices or you really should modify microservices always together. It's a sign that perhaps it's time to rethink the boundaries and merge microservices together or split it in between the other way. A release cycle and central QA. Um, here it's quite important to understand that the team not responsible anymore just for to, for, for, for produce the software to develop the software and put it in the uh, test system but you really team the responsible for production so the microservices is, is uh, a, the, your uh, product and you're responsible to release it deploy the production to monitor the production fix production problem and uh, you wake up uh, if uh, something happens in the night with your service so this is really completely team responsibility it was uh, mind changes quite um, difficult in this case. Um, some conclusions and lessons learned. First, uh, I would say the monolith is not always bad. So some, a lot of cases really start with monolith or even the continuum with monolith is, 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 is good. It's fast and pragmatic as uh, start with microservices. Also, the so split monolith to microservices, not only because if it's a, a cool or not only because of fashion, but you should have a really good reason for that. So well, for me, it was, um, I, I already mentioned that the innovations uh, uh, slow down, uh, the resiliency, the um, um, scalability, so independent scalability and so on. So if you have a good reasons, you can also really think that, yeah, it's now time to think in the um, microservices direction. Also very important to do it iteratively, to not to, uh, Try to migrate the huge the, uh, the whole system the hu uh, huge system in the, the one step. So try to use uh, strangler uh, uh, patterns, gateway patterns, and uh, to make the splitting of microservices in an iterative way. Uh, start splitting from most easy uh, microservices and most critical microservices. Also, so uh, if you the uh, something really painful that they extracted and put it into the separate deployment separate container yeah so use strangler and gateway pattern to uh, uh, provide uh, this iterative step-by-step uh, -step splitting and uh, be aware about technical and organizational challenges after split and provide microservices like a continuous integration continuous deployment pipeline central logging elastic logging search tracing monitoring Asynchronous communication. Uh, this is quite important. And also some um, organizational challenges: how to communicate with the teams, uh, how the release uh, cycles will be organized, how to see which features are already on the test system, and which is uh, which, which features on the on the production is uh, very important and becomes sometimes more difficult with the microservices as a monolith work. And uh, mistakes in the microservices boundaries definition are usually very expensive. You should refactor a lot of stuff. You should change the repositories. You should uh, reorganize the teams. Therefore, uh, my suggestion even to experiment a bit in monolith. Uh, it, for example, OSGI helps us to do it uh, using OSGI service. You can split already using the OSGI interfaces and see is it the right boundaries or not. And only after that, uh, extract the microservice. But of course, with the life, uh, the system evolves and uh, you need to rethink your boundaries, microservice boundaries, uh, because you, you're uh, working with a new services. Some services get retired and the scope changes. So this is not completely avoidable, but it's very expensive from my point of perspective. So it's important to think about it uh, and uh, make the, define the context boundaries in correct way. Yeah, so this is basically all regarding the presentation. Um, do we have, um, I see some questions already. 
We also made a product catalog as a separate microservice. We have a product uh, as a separate microservices is also responsible for product catalog. Yeah. So uh, it's not for product, uh, product catalog itself, but uh, inside the uh, product service. Uh, inventory and the prices separated in the part of the card. Uh, now the prices we have um, availability, price and availability are microservices it's responsible to uh, um, calculate the prices and provide the availabilities of the uh, products. So they combine price and availability together and provide as a microservice. Uh, um, for inventory, uh, yeah, also, also is a, inventory is most resp responsibility of the product uh, service. So the, it should it, it, it should scale differently. So it's really have a high load um, during the production, and uh, it makes sense really to um, separate it um, into single microservice. Basically, so there's a lot of uh, methodic how to separate it, but uh, in a clean way, nothing works for me. So it just a bit feeling, and uh, also trying. Uh, so you say. So you see already in the repositories uh, that uh, you have a feeling as I say, belongs together, things belong together in the business domain, uh, the business uh, subdomain. Um, in the, the, the theory, you can do it uh, using the domain-driven design. So you can define the boundary context and uh, uh, split microservices this way. You can go from the business subdomains so and to see which, from the business perspective, what the, the stuff, what the features are um, uh, fit together. You can copy organizational um, structure also in the microservice. Sometimes it works quite good. So you see which departments you have and also provide the, um, the microservices accordingly that. You can look at the transaction. So if there some processes related with transactions, uh, then it's basically could belong to the same microservices. Or you can look into events, business events, also there's a kind of event a storming uh, approach to split the microservice. Uh, how long it took to migrate the e-commerce? So I have as a first step with the, easy, with the, with the easiest microservices it was quite uh, quick as it was about some weeks. We, we had the first result. Of course, the uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster was already established by our uh, DevOps, and we have um, prepared all, all prepared to to deploy the stuff. The most time takes the splitting of the code and migrating of the core services like cart, checkout, and user, which uh, have hard interdependencies with domains and with the data. Uh, especially data is there as a feedback. So I would say API splitting and code splitting is not a big problem, but the splitting the data, it's really, really hard. Uh, so uh, really plan and reserve time for that. If in microservice, you can introduce the dependency and constantly calling the into another microservices, what is the red flag? You did not split it correctly. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I would say uh, if you have a clear hierarchy of microservices, you have kind of a technical microservices that are responsible, for example, for to, to connect or, uh, from our side was a connection to uh, external payment provider. So you just decouple this stuff. Uh, you don't like that your other services knows about differences between different payment providers. And you decouple and put into microservices. It's absolutely okay if you have a hierarchy of calls and microservices involve your uh, 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 external payment provider services. All the same with uh, uh, credit worthiness. So if microservices dependent, uh, so if responsible to check credit worthiness, and it decouple completely uh, 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 encapsulates this functionality and decouple other consumers from, from the external system. Or um, the validation of uh, VAT, so the, the the tax numbers, or address validation. That is also good candidate to decouple it, and you you could have this technical microservices on the top level. You can have more um, business uh, uh, services, and the level or you could have facades. In this case, these calls are absolutely okay from my point of view. Of course, you need to. 
see uh, if it's all synchronous calls, uh, how resilient do your system? So if you once your microservices dies, uh, is it still possible um, that uh, the system um, uh, provide kind of defaults, for example, uh, or use uh, circuit breakup uh, uh, patterns or organize asynchronous communication. So the, the long chain of calls, of course, increase the uh, fragility of your system. But in the, from architectural point of view, it's okay. The problem is when when uh, um, the service, the microservices on the same level have some interdependency. For example, uh, the card service needs something from user and user needs something from the card. This, uh, for me, is a bit red flag already. Yeah? So perhaps uh, functionality was not split it correctly. Um, so yeah, the calls in one direction is okay in here, here but uh, kind of cycle calls is uh, normally not a good, good, a, a, a good sign. Um, and of course, yeah, it's uh, just your decision and your feeling if your system works and if the teams are, are comfortable with the splitting of the microservices, you have no issues, performance issue, you have no uh, code uh, dependencies, then uh, your splitting is, 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 is correct. So uh, I cannot, cannot say that, uh, uh, that uh, there is only one way to split it. So it's a bit um, try, um, so trying process, playing process, uh, experience or collecting experience. Uh, unfortunately, the errors in the splitting microservices quite is quite expensive, but it doesn't doesn't mean that you cannot change and you cannot improve the system. And I would say absolutely uh, uh, sure that you, after some years, you need to rethink the microservices boundaries and you split in another way. Yeah. So validation service exactly. Yeah. So we have uh, uh, also, for example, um, uh, tax ID validation service that has, uh, uh, encapsulates the staff and. Uh, so normally, you, if you work quite long with the system, you have already feeling, yeah, perhaps this part is a component in the monolith, but it becomes so huge and uh, it's have quite clear uh, interface API, quite clear task. Yeah, so you see that the responsibility is quite clear, and perhaps there's a time to extract it and provide a separate microservices and uh, um, uh, there. Um, uh, it will be supported by separate team. So it's, uh, uh, this is a, um, a criterion. So it's, there are some formal criteria as well, but uh, for me, it's also a lot of feeling uh, and a lot of um, sorry, experience uh, feeling. Some, some more questions? I guess we have still some a, bit, a little bit time. Uh, so for long term, so I, I would say that the process is still running and not finished, but exactly because it's an iterative process, you can do it. Um, um, you can you can spread it a bit um, on the, on the time. So you should shouldn't do it really in in a one month. Uh, you can decide what's more critical points to start with them or easy. To, so um, low hanging fruit, uh, so you can easy with. Uh, less um, efforts you can uh, achieve a uh, uh, good result um, and for more 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 involved more complex uh, stuff you can um, spread a bit with visit with the time so it's uh, um, this iterative approach helps also quite good and they also helps to motivate to um, convince the management to to do it because you say no we continue to de 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 develop the new features Monolith system, but in parallel, we achieve uh, with, uh, our refactoring, our um, architecture changes, uh, uh, we achieve uh, resilience, we achieve uh, performance, we can scale system differently, we can uh, decouple the teams, we can, for example, give some services for outsourcing teams as, as well. So it works quite, it works quite, quite well with the uh, microservice world. This is, uh, my experience, my motivation. So.
So, any other questions? Perhaps you can share your experience with this uh, splitting within working with microservices. Okay, if not, so I um, would say thanks a lot for your participation, for good questions. And um, yeah, we can also meet in, the, in other sessions uh, and also available in uh, LinkedIn. Um, just drop me a question or you can make a short session if you'd like to discuss something regarding microservices because it's really my, my uh, a passion to <laughs> to work with the um, to change the architecture and see how the architecture improves the team motivation and improves the uh, um, uh, time to to life uh, time to develop a new features and team becomes more uh, uh, motivated and uh, have a, a lot of fun with the, with the work. Uh, this is really really interesting to see how the system evolves. Oh, then thanks a lot and see you in the next sessions. Bye bye.